Welcome guys to the series Software Testing Reimagined. Uh, this is one part of a series which is where today we are going to talk about developer experience, but this is a part of a larger series which is going on and welcome all of you guys. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone from all the part of the world which you guys are joining in. Uh, I would love to understand which all part of the world you guys are tuning in from. So uh, if you guys are joining in from your phones, you can go to slido.com. Uh, and just scan this QR code, or if you're joining in from your laptops, uh, go to slido.com and put the hashtag browser stack. There would be a section asking for uh, questions. You can just, um, yes. Audio and chat has been disabled. That's intentional. Started seeing answers coming in. People from UK, India. Nice. A lot of folks from Canada, Colorado. Interesting. This might keep changing because the number of participants are still increasing. It has already crossed almost to 300. It's going up. Interesting. Netherlands is also picking up. Nice. Nice. Wow. Wow, a lot of folks from UK, US, Canada. Nice. Germany, Italy, Denver, Brazil, Copenhagen, Denver. Nice. Alaska and Italy. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Keep voting. I think uh, I'll keep the poll on. So you keep answering this question. Awesome. Awesome. So, guys, let me kick off today's uh, fireside chat. But introducing the topic for today, which is improving developer experience. Uh, all of you developers and QA engineers are tuning in from across the world. So we wanted to create a platform where different speakers from different industries come together to discuss on this topic. And that is where we came up with an idea of doing a fireside chat. So this is the first of fireside chat of many to come where we are trying to kick off on this topic. Now, uh, just a few housekeeping items for today. Like we're going to run this session for 60 minutes. Uh, we are going to make sure that the session is also recorded so that you can get the recordings at the end of the session. And as asked in the q and I have made sure that the participants are muted just to make sure that it enables, uh, it enables our speakers to speak in a proper fashion. And at the end, we have dedicated 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, of course, we are, not we are going to try as much as possible to accommodate all the questions. Uh, you guys can use the Zoom Q&A to ask any questions in between. Now, to give you a brief background about browser stack, right now we are world's largest leading software testing platform across the globe. Uh, and I just don't like it with respect to the statement is not justified with respect to only saying it, but uh, with respect to the scale of products which we have. So we cater across different categories. We are into web testing across three lines of products, live, automate, and Percy for manual automated testing and visual testing. And same we are able to solve in mobile application testing as well. So we have app live and app automate to solve these app problems. Uh, we want to give back to the community as well. And that's why we also offer different free tools. Our initial set of products were screenshots and responsive and in two performance testing is speed lab. Now that's the breadth of products, which we have, but we also have a larger scale with us where right now there are 6 million registered users who use power stack on a daily basis. And today we are able to solve 72 billion Selenium commands every year. And as in the quiz, uh, like in the poll, as well, as you saw, people are tuning in across the globe. We cater to 135 different countries customers, and we have 16 globally distributed data centers. So that's the scale at which we are running right now. And of course, uh, we are able to cater to different industries customers. We have people uh, like we have customers from BSI. Uh, we have media, retail, as you can see on the screen, all the RQ customers are currently using browser stack. Uh, so just now that you have a background about browser stack as well, I would like to introduce the, uh, the host for today. So we have Charlie who heads customer engineering, who's going to be the host for our session. He has till date met thousands of developers 
understood their problem and created a proper solution to help them move forward. So he was our perfect choice to make sure that he should be able to host this session across our uh, different speaker lineup. I would now shift to uh, Charlie, who would be taking up the session. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Naveen. <clears throat> I have one pleasure to meet you. I'd like to introduce the three panelists who will be speaking today. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Nakul Agarwal, who is the co-founder and CTO of Browsertech. Uh, Nakul is an entrepreneur and technologist who has built cutting-edge companies. Uh, having discovered a need for cross-platform testing, he co-founded and scaled Browsertech to a $4 billion company. Next, we have Girish uh, Bashit, um, Associate Director of QA at NTT Data UK. Uh, Garish is a delivery consultant with over 16 years of experience in IT. Uh, he comes from a vast experience of managing digital transformation of e-commerce and self-serve digital platforms. And finally, uh, we have Ronak Ray, who's VP of Quality Assurance at Forbes. Uh, he's an industry veteran with over 12 years of experience and is a true believer of coaching and leading team members by example in agile testing activities. Now, for today's topic, uh, we're gonna be talking about developer experience. Uh, so developer experience can be defined as how easy is your developer's life? Uh, organizations have defined a lot of frameworks to measure developer experience, and some even have a dedicated developer experience team to monitor and improve uh, these metrics. So I think to start things off, um, uh, I really like the story of Nikul and Ritesh, uh, you know, BrowseDAC's co-founders. Um, who were two young developers who faced you know, a pretty bad experience and set out to fix the problem uh, for the world. Uh, Nikul, could you please tell this story? Sure, of course, uh, happy to. So uh, I think it started, uh, so we were building a small, I think our uh, website uh, for ourselves, I think it was a WordPress website, simple. The Building the website took probably two to three days with a simple temp uh, template of the uh, market and doing some edits to it. But testing was, uh, I think there we had an argument who will do the testing because back in the days, I8 and I were very popular. And I said, I'm not going to do the testing. It's a pretty painful process. Uh, we used to work on the, our MacBooks. And uh, at that time, I think you had to download the VMs and running on the VMs on your machines and stuff. That was a very, very tedious task uh, to debug websites and fix them. And he said, okay, let me try it this time. Uh, I think from when he started the journey of Donald EVM, so, so this is very, very painful. There has to be an easier way to do it. I think that's where we, uh, he started exploring uh, how we should go about solving it. And I think that's where the journey and the discussion started on why we should solve the problem. And we realized in our previous stint of uh, last two failed startups, we had a huge problem of testing in iBrowser. browser. Uh, and it's a genuine problem, which a lot of customers have, uh, a lot of engineers like us also face. Like there's a lot of conversations on, so we did a little bit of research. We realized there's a lot of conversation on Stack Workflow, a lot of conversation on Twitter, where people are hating IE for things not working on it, CSS selector challenges, and the debugging was also a huge issue. Uh, so we realized there's a problem we should solve for, and that's where we started our journey of building the stack. And the first version was only about uh, an easier access to I with the developer tools and you could test your local websites as well. Uh, so you could test local host or your internal websites. And uh, uh, obviously we, uh, I think there used to be Firebug back in the day and it was fairly popular a dev tool uh, back in the days. Uh, so we integrated that as well in the remote I browser. So you could debug if it's not working, why it's not working. I think those are the two big differentiators we had on how people were doing locally. So it was a not just a easier access to IE, but it has something which people didn't have on their local uh, systems or internal setups. So I think that's where the journey started. Uh, and we fast forward, I think we realized the market moving to mobile and then we moved to mobile devices. And today it's a lot more about fragmentation of mobile devices, where it's from iPhones to iPads, uh, viewports, uh, resolutions, versions, to I think Android has a, uh, thanks to Android, there's a lot more fragmentated problem there with all the brands and uh, models and versioning there as well. Uh, so I think there's a huge shift in the, and the mob, most of the half of the world is mobile first today and the rest of the half is shifting towards in that direction. So I think that's where we are uh, quickly talking about where we are going next. I think we want to be like uh, Naveen pointed out, we want to probably be the, uh, we want to solve everything in testing. We want to make sure the developer experience is becomes like we, everyone should focus on building their websites and their apps and not about how to make it easier to go to production and we want to enable all these engineers developers and qa teams out there to be able to make their life a lot more easier and the time to market reduces drastically 
So uh, that's what we are focusing towards now. And uh, what would you say was the initial value proposition or what, what attracted BrowseStack's first set of customers? Sure. Uh, so uh, I believe the simplicity of the solution, I think really uh, uh, made it easier for a bit attracted first, first set of engineers. I think we reached out to a lot of our, uh, uh, I think people on Twitter and Stack Overflow, guys, do you want to, uh, like whosoever was saying such a pain, I such a pain, I think we'll probably just uh, directly send message. Uh, we probably did a lot of spam initially, uh, personally. <laughs> I think that some of that converted really well and few people really liked it. They started tweeting it and that's probably it got picked up. Uh, but I, we realized later that the, this was such a big problem for all of the engineers and the testers out there that they were really, really looking for an easier way to do it. Uh, the value proposition was just an easier access to IE browser where you could test and debug it. I think those are the two things which probably the stand us apart. Got it. So, you know, giving a simple way to do all that testing, yeah. you know, really attracted a lot of people. Yeah. Now, you know, switching gears over to, uh, to Ronic, um, What's your take on you know this kind of developer experience? So uh, hi everyone, um, thanks for having me. So for developer experience, I feel like developers are core of our engineering organization. So if their experience is better, indirectly it benefits us as a QA organization as well, so that we can do our job better, we can do our job seamlessly, and ultimately we can deliver a product better. Because if everyone does their job seamlessly and they're happy then we can do better. So I feel like developer experience is a core of everything we do as a QA. Like the main role of QA team, according to me, is more of providing feedback. And the faster we provide feedback, it improves their developer experience and helps them to have less friction during their day-to-day -day and they can do their job better as well. So we are more of a supporting pillar for their developers. And the way it helps us, it helps them as well to so have their better experience and then we can do our job better. So I feel like it's incredibly important to have uh, a good set of processes, good set of tools in place so that the experience is better and we can ultimately deliver a better product. So, you know, you mentioned uh, collaborating like with the QA team versus helping developers and, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of cross team collaboration. Um, how do you find organizational structure affecting uh, developer experience and how do you organize your QA team to best do that? Right. So the way we do that is, I think many of the, many of the, it's very standard industry practice now. So we don't work in silos anymore. The first thing we do is we don't, we work very hands-on or hand in hand with the developer. So our engineering team is divided into different product teams and each product team has a dedicated QA person. So they work with the same QA person throughout the life cycle of the product. So they, they, they have the same working style they're familiar with what type of feedback the QA you're going to get from the QA and whatnot. They all, the QA also becomes an SME if they are a dedicated person in, into that product group. So we have a dedicated QA or for manual as well as for automation engineers within the same set of product teams, which we call it. And they work hands in hand together. So they, they have a consistency of feedback, consistency of the working style, and then they work well together. So that has helped a lot to improve the experience as well, where the devs are, gets more comfortable over time with the QA they work in every day. And also it helps from QA perspective is that they can understand the product better. They are not shuffling teams. Gone are the days where devs throw the code over the wall, QA picks it up, they start testing their things and start working on it. So it's more iterative process, it's more collaborative process. We call it agile. I, I'm, I it's debatable if we follow 100% agile, but we try to be as close as possible to get more feedback, iterative loop as possible. And then when I say we, support developer experiences we have different types of feedback loops which we can i can talk more later on but just to summarize what you're asking for is that we have dedicated qa people embedded within the product team which helps to test the software better that's great yeah um well girish uh, i saw you laughing when ronick mentioned agile um, and following that very closely um do you have any other insights into how it you know highly efficient engineering team should operate? Uh, sure, hi, Charlie, hi, everyone. Um, I think in my opinion, uh, we, need to, we need to empower these engineering teams, right? The product teams in terms of finding out the uh, processes and the tools and the solutions that works best for them. At the end of the day, I think quality is not just a responsibility of a tester. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the overall team who's delivering the product, right? So 
uh, in terms of, I think, uh, tooling, obviously, it, it really helps both developer and QA how frequent they can get the access to the information that they need, right? Developers usually are quite ahead in terms of their development of the user stories, for example, a sprint or two ahead, then the QA who is kind of lag behind. But I think if they can get the information right in time when their thought process is aligned to, to sort of QA's thought process, for, for example, you know, you developer might work on a story and deliver it and hand it over to test, but two or three weeks down the line, they may not even know the code that they've written, right? They are, they are the, so that, that kind of a process, I think if we can close that gap between the dev and the QA, by using the tools like browser stack because i remember it when we rolled it out in our our uh, telco teams within bt i had uh, a lot of developers in, interested in, in using the tool as well so we initially rolled out only to the qa community so 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 i think it's for me it's more about bridging that gap and bringing the quality responsibility on both the shoulders dev and qa <laughs> got it well um thanks for that um you know, one thing that I've started to see a little bit more of recently are teams um, uh, measuring developer experience or, you know, or their developer velocity um, using, you know, something called like a developer velocity index, uh, which typically assesses a company across three different categories. Um, one being organizational culture and alignment, uh, two being technological practices, and three being um, infrastructure. Um, and this can you know, affect more than just the speed of delivery, but also the degree of empowerment their developers actually receive and their, you know, the ability to act autonomously in the way they need to. Um, so I've actually got a question for the audience here. Uh, so out of the different items here, what do you think is the most um, important contributor to DVI? Looks like we're seeing a whole lot of organizational culture driving things, um, and uh, and you know, followed by technological practices. But that culture aspect really looks like it's you know leading the pack here. So um, sort of open to everyone, the cool gears or ironic. Um, is this aligned to what you are seeing, um, or the way you would evaluate uh, you know, the contributing factors to uh, DVI? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tom, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, definitely. I think cultural alignment is great for, or actually it's actually the key factor as well to improve the DVI because what we have seen in the past is, uh, or let me give you a story. So we generally used to, historically a QA team within my organization in the past was known to be like a team who doesn't understand the product that well. We, were, we had a notion that, oh, they ask devs all the questions, then they test, and then it's been a lot of back and forth. And then we were considered a second-class citizen in that whole developer QA relationship. So the cultural shift which we did was started hiring devs, which are or devs as a QA who are strong in programming. They are on par with the same skill set as the engineers or who are developers in the same organization. So that has helped significantly to have same bar between the dev and a QA, and they have started now relying on QA. So they actually help the culturally between fill fill the gap between those two because they can speak the same language. And then we started taking feedback from devs and QA both back and forth together. So we used to do quarterly surveys where we send anonymous questions to devs and get that feedback and what we should change on. So those feedback has helped to stay our cultural between the devs and QA and then the rapport between them has improved significantly based on the changes we implemented. Yeah, I think I completely uh, resonate with Rana here. I think, uh, uh, like Rana mentioned, I think we had a similar journey. We were. QA embedded into teams, then we moved to central QA teams, and then we moved back to QA people uh, back into the teams. And I think the biggest shift which helped the company, I think, progress uh, move a lot more faster, including happy engineers, was moving the ownership of quality to the uh, engineering manager of the team, which probably is responsible with all the people combined. And now his decision on how to leverage capability of the QA or the asset member in the team. So uh, to make it, uh, I think, not just deliver high quality software, but make sure engineers are happy as well. So from the culture of where estates or the QA teams were seen as a blocker for releases, now they're seen as an enabler for the releases. 
and i think that mindset shift is it's helped uh, become uh, i think it transformed the way people looked at the qa organization altogether uh, now they are looked at okay they are going to help me deliver high quality software rather than they are going to deliver my release and of course as a organization i think i wouldn't say uh, i would say this is a 50% of the problem 50% is still the technologically setups i think we invest at least in during why at least in pal stack initially invested a lot more on production than on staging and our internal infrastructure this was a i think big learning where i was like oh i'm not going to spend this much on our internal systems right this doesn't make sense at all uh, but i think as i realized for the developer productivity and including both qa teams and engineers having an efficient uh, i think pre prod to staging environments where things could be tested at a high quality with high pace is just far more important and valuable than i thought it is and a lot of this value came up once i built a very simple metric dashboard on okay this is my cycle time developer starting to production is 10 days four days is uh, qa time and i then asked the qa team or not us, i probably had the metric dashboard i realized two days is regression and two days is manual uh, final release cycle and there's like environment challenges environment is slow not equal to production uh, i think a lot of these challenges which were like sounded very uh, uh, i didn't thought they are such a big uh, problems uh, so technologically i think in your previous questions on the uh, thing and the technology and infrastructure turned out to be a big enabler as well so i would say those were the uh, really helped through probably reduce the qa time from four days to one day now and uh, whether it's a regression time down to one hour i think it's still one hour because we have like a huge test speed now we are looking into splitting it further but uh, made a huge difference yeah. now uh gears did you have you seen you know did you have a similar evolution or you seen the same um roi so i think whenever testing in environments so I, i i would i would add a couple of things i think um, i moved in from a product to sort of consultancy recently and uh, the way i'm i'm looking at it i'm i'm looking after multiple clients now and and there are still a lot of stakeholders who are of the mindset that that qa sits sort of outside of the uh, sort of engineering team and any 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 money spent on tooling or processes that uh, for example browser stack uh, all out etc is is an overhead so i think that mindset still needs to change across a lot of a uh, lot of our stakeholders across industries as well uh, so organization culture and and the transformation journey of any organization is key to improving any developer experience in my opinion i think unless unless the mindset sort of changes in that direction i really don't see how you can improve the uh, developer experience in my opinion because it's all about you know failing fast and and providing that feedback loop back to the developers i think uh, if you have not improved that and uh, you have not changed the culture and the way you structured your engineering teams across across your departments business units um i think you you're doomed to fail but yeah uh, that 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 to me i think culture is main transformation project yeah okay so sort of building off that um in terms of establishing the culture and getting the right mindset across the different teams um how does hiring and training or enabling individuals play into all of that uh, so again i think uh, what we what we did as part of one of the transformation projects recently is that uh, when we moved away from waterfall ways of working to more sort of squad based kind of a model where we built in these engineering teams i think hiring and retaining the talent and changing the mindset of engineers that qa is everyone's responsibility uh, helped us a lot in a way grooming the existing engineers uh, within the team as well there were a few engineers for example who were willing to pick up uh, things like you know uh, for qa activities which could be used to automate some of the scripts there were some engineers who who moved uh, into qa for example who had the uh, qa acumen in them uh, and and vice versa as well so i think grooming the existing resources hiring the right talent who have the knowledge of the new tools that you're trying to implement uh, really does help things like pair programming you know getting engineer uh, two engineers working together i think really helps a lot uh, understanding each other's point of view for example dev and qa sitting together and looking at a story testing that together i think it really helps as well so bringing in that kind of a culture within the team also helps i would add one more thing as well to what what was gary said is that in my past experience what has also helped in the hiring process is to have dev involved in the hiring process for qa as well so in my hiring there there is a interview section for devs to be part of the qa hiring process as well so they interview people who they will be working on who they will like with working on so they are equal partners in our hiring process so in our whole hiring chain 
there is a couple of interview steps which lead devs or whoever is the architect within that product room interviews the QA engineer. So they they have an equal voice and also we feel that they are heard and then they get the right person who they will be working with. So that helps a lot. Does that also um, you know, have a longer term impact where they become more, uh, they take more ownership of the quality from a developer side, you know, even after someone's hiring because they know what you know, QA is looking to do? Yeah, it does. And also be, and in our, our culture, it's like we have set up a culture is that it's not just QA write automation script. It's not QA who will be reviewing their script. Devs also give feedback for our code reviews. Our code reviews process are such that devs reviews our PRs. We review devs PR as well. So there's very iterative collaborative process where they give feedback. So they understand like what type of test we are doing at a end-to-end -end test level, at a higher level. And QA does, or devs do, do the test at the lower level. And then they, so they know where we are missing the gap. QA understands the code base. So I think it's more collaborative in what we automate as well, what we manually test. So it's all fits together culturally that quality is baked in there. We cannot ship this product if all the checks are in our GitHub PR checks doesn't pass. So we have cultural build that devs actually push that, oh, I cannot release this because some of the tests are failing. Can someone take a look? And then QA engineers goes there and see that, oh, this test is failing because of the amazing flakiness of Selenium, Cypress, environment, other issues, or is actually a real bug. So we actually work pair together and it's culturally baked in between the within our organization that we both are responsible to make sure that everything is green before we push out to production. Got it. Now, Nicole, sort of one thing that Rana just brought up was the um, the separation between manual versus automated testing. Um, how have uh, how has Browser Stack evolved um, in that relationship, or those two different uh, organizational styles? Uh, I think there's still uh, uh, heavy on automation. There is obviously some aspect of manual which always remains because you are catching up on the new releases you want to do immediately. So there will be some catch up of automation always. Uh, but uh, I think I did experiment with manual ones. I think the my ability to, I, my experience so far, I think my ability to get huge respect on engineering was a little difficult uh, because then engineers start feeling this guy is not going deep dive or not. And we being a very technical product, I think it makes it a little more harder. But one thing I thought I was, a, a, I did a mistake as well, I think. There is a unique capability which is uh, QS bring in, which is probably outside in thought process, which engineers don't have. They're already inside out, and that's a huge capability uh, must have in these roles. Uh, and I think that added uh, that going through education myself and educating my team, I think was a difficult journey, more from an organization culture perspective. But I think we are in a good space today, and people do understand and respect when the someone like an SA or a QA team is saying something where they are coming from. Because I think once they realize they're enablers and what they're saying is for the quality, better quality of the product. And we have systems in place as well to make sure our releases are not blocked because of these, uh, we are all one team. I think it went probably a far way to uh, get to where we are. Uh, but I think it's sometimes it's get painful, but I think it's totally worth the change that we need to all bring in. Yeah, you know, I, it's been interesting seeing like the you know maturity evolution of Browser Stack, you know, in the time I've spent here as well. Um, so, you know, switching a little bit, um, you know, you talk about the evolution of you know, certainly a Browser Stack, but also some of the other companies, the like gearish the clients you work with, or Ron, like what you're doing at Forbes, um, and the you know maturity growth uh, teams experience over time, and to get or to get to the point where they are right now. So one thing I want to turn over to the audience and ask a question to everyone listening um, is around uh, how mature would you grade your own testing setups today? I've got another slide up, up on screen. Um, so if you were you know, looking at your, at your testing itself um, on the strictly manual side, uh, all the way to a fully, you know, fully automated or fully you know, mature setup, how would you evaluate yourself? So it looks like we're seeing um, quite a lot of uh, automation beginner. It looks like that's sort of in the middle there with some manual and some more advanced automation on either side. Um, just a little bit of fully automated. Um, now it looks like we're sort of balancing around the automation beginner, people who are just getting started with automation. 
Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. Glad to have everyone who was able to join, you know, see what stages you're all at. Yeah, automation fully connected to this need. And I'd probably say like pirate to get there. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, sort of with this in mind, uh, I was able to see the uh, McKinsey uh, Dev Security Out report um, for 2021, which mentioned uh, you know, quite a lot about the developer velocity and its business impact um, that we see across organizations. Um, and that report is based on a survey of 440 senior executives at, uh, across top enterprises. Um, and uh, one thing we saw was that developers or organizations with, uh, with high developer velocity, um, or at least in the top quartile, tended to grow four to five times faster um, and show 55% you know, higher innovation uh, than their um, competition. Um, so, uh, Nicole, um, having worked with a you know, variety of different teams, what are some of the practices that you've seen of uh, the happiest teams, either around um, frequency of release, uh, what their build times look like, their adoption of cloud infrastructure, things of, those, things of uh, that sort? Sure. Uh, so I think for first, I think completely agree. I don't think I have an objective as objective data as McKinsey, uh, but I think uh, the fundamental comes down to a lot of your engineer mind is free figuring rather than figuring out or QA teams figuring out how to release. They are focusing on, okay, this release is going to happen. Let me figure out what needs to build. So that probably leads a lot more free mind to think about uh, innovation and solving more problems for the company. So that's a huge impact I've seen. Uh, if I look at the customers' uh, journeys, which I have been uh, stumbled upon, or oh, it looks like we might have uh, lost Nakul there for a moment. But turning it over to Ronak and Girish, uh, well, hopefully you know Nakul unfreezes. Oh, are you back? Oh, sorry, sorry about that, guys. Uh, can you guys hear me? We lost you about ten seconds. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think I'd probably just take a step back back in 2006 when AWS uh, came in and how it just transformed on way we could launch our new product instantly overnight uh, rather than waiting on the IT teams to procure hardware and stuff. I think fast forward today, uh, I suppose all of us, in, it's not about in, like developers or QAs, all of us are so used to using cloud tools and making sure our decision making is very decentralized. We can tools, use tools and procure and not just procurement, I think uh, the innovation levels have gone to different level. Engineers are so empowered uh, everywhere and the tooling has become so much easier uh, that all these things today to do probably releases multiple times a day, improving, integrating accessibility check, including uh, uh, I think the checks like uh, static code analyzer, there is just enough tooling available, both from software and infrastructure perspective. And that the innovation is at, uh, uh, I, think the, uh, I think best time for engineers, I would say. Uh, and uh, that's probably helped us to release like, the best teams, I would say. And uh, it's probably almost, I've seen like 90 times a day. That's what our numbers I've heard. And I was like, how do you do nine? Like in eight hours, how can you release 90 times a day? Uh, but I think that's the best number I have seen. Uh, I think, uh, and that's not necessarily earlier. I thought this will be the, I think the top tech, uh, like, you know, top tech companies who are going through this journey. Uh, I think I worked with the BFSI, I worked with e-commerce players. Uh, and there, uh, I always thought from outside that these organizations don't move fast. I was surprised by the maturity of these organizations and how they were able to transform themselves. Like one of the BFSI has like 50,000 test suites and a parallel, uh, I think the uh, infrastructure setup of 10,000 VMs uh, to just be able to, I think, release, uh, build a build time to few hours. And at that scale, they were doing few hours. Imagine, I think, how big the test suite and the maturity of the team would have been. Uh, and that was just, I think, an eye opener for me. And I have how, I think that's probably to my previous point on the uh, investment on my staging environments and my infrastructure in house probably changed that way. Uh, I think if we need to probably move much faster as well, I think, uh, I think 10 times a day is a pretty uh, good release, uh, which people I've seen like, like a more average across various companies. Uh, build times. I think everyone is aspiring for five to 10 minutes. Uh, we are, uh, I think Browstack is roughly an hour today and probably there is a lot of investment going on uh, uh, to probably get it to 10 minutes, but uh, five to 10 minutes is I've seen a very sweet spot. Everyone is aspiring to get their big time too. Uh, but the cloud adoption across all the players, including Browstack, I think we use some hundred plus cloud players today internally. 
uh, and I'm sure like all the companies I speak to is very, very heavily towards focus on my key business. This is my key uh, business opportunity or the business problem I need to solve and let others solve the other problem. And that's where I think it's probably able to innovate a lot more on core business or the key mode for each business. And that has helped tremendously to all of them and to obviously affect them. So uh, Ronak and Girish, um, what have you seen, or have you seen the same uh, the same practices that Nicole was just mentioning across the different teams you've worked with, and um, what did, what uh, what have you seen enable those practices, and um, what would be the ideal state for your teams you want to reach? I could not agree with more with Nicole what he said. So in 2019, we used to be on our own physical server, our application was, and we used to release two releases in a week. So Tuesdays and Thursdays, we used to releases and our release and Mondays and Wednesdays used to be crazy days for QA team because you had to QA all the tests on the integration branch, make sure everything works correctly and then deploy to production. We would pick a DevOps guy who deploys it for us. And now, now with the adoption of cloud where we are 100% on Google cloud, it make our life so much easier. So now we do seven to eight releases in a day then two releases in a week. And our, uh, we run around 20,000 20, tests, which takes around 45 minutes to run across different types of tests. So, and we do like functional testing, we do EDA testing, we do accessibility testing, we do some, if those are all run tests and some visual testing, they all run in the same PR. And we can spin up our test environment like by just adding a label on GitHub, so on the PR. So those, in those automations, those infrastructure has saved so much time from developers to think about like they have to worry about or do how who will deploy it, how will things will go to production, who will monitor it. So we have automated check where as soon as our branch is merged to master, we deploys to Canary when our test runs on Canary. If it looks good, then we send a Slack notification. It goes to production. So all those automation has made life so much easier, and the developer journey has helped, and then also has helped our QA maturity tremendously. Like I mentioned before, we used to do those quarterly surveys, our rate score, we have the same sort of questions every year, last three years. But since we implemented all those automation workflows and made life easier once we moved to Google Cloud and using Cloud Run and all those good, good stuff from the cloud, which helps us to run and deploy application faster, that has our score for feedback from other team increased from 3.4 to like 4.3 right now out of five. So it has increased like tenfold. So I think those tools have helped so much to increase our QA maturity as well as satisfaction from our peers, like product and the engineering team. Uh, if I can just add, I think it's it's again, uh, I think a, a, an organization change uh, in terms of you know how how they built or architect their overall solution, right? So I worked in uh, in BT where we moved away from our monolith architecture to more microservices based architecture where we had sort of SPAs built on, on, on the web, right? Multiple SPAs, right? So that really helped to move away from like two month, I think we were releasing every two month to about uh, twice daily. So I think that that took about, I think 12 to 24 months uh, kind of a transformation for our website which was a huge transformation. Uh, but again, uh, tooling helped, moving to cloud helped, building those CI CD pipelines helped, breaking down the uh, products, the customer journeys into different small teams really helped. So a lot of those factors really helped to improve the overall frequency of, of the releases, how fast we could deliver. Plus, I think uh, the fact that we could run tests in parallel, right? A lot of tests in parallel, which used to take, I don't know, an hours and hours to run, breaking them down into minutes. Really, I think it helped as well. So I think there are multiple factors that that uh, make a release go faster, but I think those were the key ones. And Charlie, I think you've spoken to a lot of customers as well. Would love to hear from you as well. Yeah, well, no, it's all the same thing. One, one thing that Girish just mentioned that I, you know, I agree with very, very strongly is breaking up monoliths. Um, uh, and, you know, just dealing with you know, a particular like automated test case, um, having some, like a lot of small independent tests is just so much more flexible than having a single long running thing. Um, so it's not surprising at all that the same uh, objective or the same approach, has, you know, reaps benefits across not just, you know, running a single driver instance, but you know something more organizational about breaking up use cases or breaking up architectures or 
or things of that sort, just so you have more, um, more independent, more flexible, uh, more fluid um, processes across the board. It makes total sense, and that, that really stands out to me. Now, um, I have one last question I want to pose to the audience um, you know, about the developer experience. Um, namely, uh, what is the one blocker that um, you think is the most difficult in overcoming when uh, achieving a higher developer experience? Again, um, go to slido.com and put in browser stack or scan that QR code on your screen uh, to get access to this poll. Inertia. Very first thing is inertia. That that makes a lot of sense, nice. especially with how important culture we talk at the beginning. We talk about the cultural importance. That makes total sense. Yep, culture change. Um, cost benefit is an interesting one. Bugs time. Um, as you know, some of these big things are coming through. Uh, you know. Any of these stand out to you know any of the three of you as something that you you know struggled to overcome or or you know really impeded your progress along the way? Uh, I, I think for because I think I'm in my case at least I was driving the culture as well, so it was relatively easier for me to solve that one. Uh, I think infrastructure was a personally a bigger one for me because of just like I said, right? I really, I just wasn't uh, ready to spend that much on testing. Uh, I didn't realize the impact is not on the internal or the testing, it's actually on the developer productivity, it's just a lot more innovation. I think that just mindset shift for me personally was, uh, uh, it took some, I would say an year or so to figure it out and then enable people, uh, enable myself and my teams to become a lot more productive. I think we have good systems in place, but not the right infrastructure or uh, in some cases, uh, uh, one or two vendors as well. After that, I think just, uh, it changed overnight for all my engineering team. I go next the next the main one could be for me as well is infrastructure and cultural as well because infrastructure I mean there are a lot of dependencies within your infrastructure which needs to be taken care of when we want to improve your developer experience and certain things are not easy fixes it needs like six months of tech debt to be done it or rewrite something from scratch or redo it again which is not very efficient for the business which is not very efficient so it doesn't help it's sometimes it's the nature of the role that you are stuck there and you can't do anything about it because this is how it is and it won't be useful until we change the whole architecture, whole the system. So that's the hard part. And then also the for the cultural side, I would say like breaking mindset of a person who is so adaptive or not very receptive to change, like someone is not receptive to change and it's hard to achieve that as well, where you want to set, where you want to stick with the existing process, don't want to change it, then it's hard to achieve this as well. Makes sense. Okay, well, we're coming up on um, you know the forty-five minute mark, so I do want to highlight you know some of the main things that uh, or some of the big takeaways I had from this session. Um, you know, one very immediate thing is uh, that uh, testing is and you know and quality is a major component of developer experience, um, ensuring that you know the right the right code gets released, everything works, spend less time chasing bugs. Um, ensuring everyone's on the same page and happy is you know critical um and then you know when you talk about you know highly functional engineering teams uh the culture and acceptance of quality as a you know as a key milestone or, or key objective is critical um and also adopting necessary you know practices and technologies um you know practices like a you know, continuous integration con continuous delivery having solid pipelines and technologies including how you actually deliver those pipelines, as well as the infrastructure you're using to support um, not just testing itself, but the overall, overall applications, um, particularly when adopting you know, a cloud infrastructure. Now, um, so again, thank you guys for, for sharing those thoughts. Uh, we have a few questions that have come through uh, from the audience um, during the conversation um, that I want to make sure to get to. Uh, first, um, you know, just calling out some of the upcoming events the Browse Deck is throwing. Um, we have a few upcoming webinars and another virus fireside chat. Um, uh, first, uh, from a webinar standpoint, um, how the weather 
company is uh, is you know uh, beating fragmentation across different devices. Um, that's going to be on July 13th. Uh, the next fireside chat, much like what we're doing today, um, is going to be on July 19th, focusing on the actual journey of uh, testing maturity and scaling up a QA environment or QA um, organization uh, with Anand, Moret, and Sonia. And then lastly, a uh, final um, evolution of QA uh, at, at Gojek um, being presented by uh, Prashanta Biswa um, later in July. Uh, if you scan the QR code um, in the top right, you'll be able to save these dates and get these um, added to your calendars. Now, um, with that said, in the last 15 minutes, I want to turn things over to uh, some of the questions that came through uh, from the audience. Um, uh, the first one that you know stands out to me and has had a good amount of feedback or you know conversation in the QA or in the Q and A um, panel. Um, and the question is you know, sort of jokingly: Is the message that only developers can work in QA? How do you guys respond to that? <laughs> I don't think so. At least personally, I I I didn't mean to probably send that as a message. I think QA, uh, like I said earlier, I think there is a huge scope for manual QA as well, and including estates as well, like the outside end thinking. I don't think I could get my developers to do that job really well, uh, and that's a huge capability miss if I have a pure dev team alone. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think we just need to figure out the dynamics of the product and the teams, like the really fast moving teams have a huge opportunity for manual QA as well, because they won't never be able to catch up with uh, 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 the automation and itself in the background. So, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't feel that's what I meant at all. I had my two cents. I, I feel like there is, and that's my hope is that people will change the face of QA as who cannot code. I think if we change that mindset that if you write good code, doesn't matter if you're writing a code for building an application or you're helping the applications. It's if you can write code, it's you are a developer. I don't think it's a different role as dev versus QA, like a DevOps person, DevOps person who writes infrastructure code. He, he writes, he helps out to build the software. Similarly, QA plays a role to build it. And for manual testers who write the test, they are critical part as well, because who will, mimic your user who will be putting in their shoes as a user and test the application. So I think both roles are really required. And I think it's more education is required in this industry to, to get them to get like, excited for this role. I, when I hire someone as a QA engineer, I tell them that you are not building the application, but you're writing the same amount of code, same quality of code. There is no standard difference between a dev will write a code versus a QA will write a code. It has to be the same, which is why we have QA or devs review our PR. We, we review devs PR. So we get the same feedback. We have the same standards. So I think there's more industry education required to change that mindset. Thanks. Now, um, another one that I think is, you know, an interesting question that came through. Um, you know, we're talking about developer velocity. Um, now, we talked about the benefits it can bring to the table um, and why you want to do it. But, um, it can be easy to be misinterpreted as um, ship faster, you know, at all costs, which can, you know, correspondingly hurt quality um, as you get more code out there, out there as quickly as possible. How do you ensure that the, um, how can you be sure to avoid that culturally or from a developer mindset? So uh, at least for me, uh, I think I have quality is, uh, I think paramount, time to market is second. Like I can live with slower time to market, but can't live with a poor quality product. I think developer experience, uh, not for internal, but for ex like the for customer experience is the most important thing we all exist for. And that you probably play with it, it's probably all going south. Uh, so we have a very clear metric in our, uh, like the report which comes to me, you cannot have a, any bug ship to customers in the name of going fast. Uh, I think it, uh, so that probably makes sure we are not crossing the line in the name of faster uh, speed. I think it's highlighting those yeah key risk areas, right? And addressing that and pointing that out to your stakeholders that, right, this is the level of QA that has been done. Um, it's not gonna go any faster than that. If you want this level of QA, for example, stress, volume, any level of 
additional queue that's required before it's shipped or deployed into production. I think uh, as long as we highlight that to their audience, I think it's, you can make the right call. But yes, yeah, it's, it's not about going faster. It's about improving the quality of the product that you deliver. I'll add one more thing into that is that if there is a need for the business that has to go out fast, like what we have done in, in, in recently is we started releasing feature with feature flags, which was really easy to turn on and off. So if something is really wrong when we release for the sake of releasing certain things faster, we turn off the feature flag for certain users and only a few users has it. So impact of releasing bugs is way, way lesser. So it's feature flagging the release, releases certain things for more time in the production and baked in that feature and then slowly do post-launch fixes. Got it, thank you. Now, we have a couple other questions. There have been a few that have all been sort of around the idea of, of a best practice or a goal um, as a, you know, in terms of ratios. Like how much, like how many QAs per developer should you have or per project? Um, what percentage of manual versus automation uh, should you be aiming for? Like should you be aiming for 50%, 70%, 80%, 90% automation? Um, and then how do you uh, balance the, you know, the manual QAs themselves and the headcount there versus the automated QAs? How do you, and if, uh, if there isn't a set number or set goal in mind for you know, that whole item, how would you go about determining what makes the most sense for your particular project? Or not you go first. Oh, sure. Um, so I don't have a hard number, which like a dev QA ratio should be one is to two or one is to three. But generally I have a set of rule is if the type, type of task which are required for a manual automation person are sufficient for the team, then that's the right amount. So for example, if, so our manual team is solely focused on exploratory testing, we don't write test cases and go through checklist test cases one after the other and after it's done submit a report saying that oh this is what we executed we don't do that we all we do is do exploratory testing of the feature which is re releasing or which is already on production so how much time it takes to do that for one person and it is it impacting our release cycle so i have one benchmark which i use which is called a qa review so in jira we, i had run a report where a ticket in one particular uh, in qa column how long the ticket sits in so if the trend is going upwards, that it stays in that column longer. It means that it takes longer for us to test. So how can we reduce it to add more automation, add more tools, or to add more people to work on that thing? So that's the benchmark I look at to figure out what ratio is best for us. But yes, for in my current team, we have one manual person within the product group, and then we have three or four automation engineers who help out to automate because we are heavy on automation. We are very mature automation organization. So it makes sense to have us for more automation resources or people working on them versus the manual. But it depends on team and depends on your product for sure. Girish, you want to add anything? I think it's about limiting your work in progress. You know, looking at your backlog, if you have higher amount of tickets within the dev buckets, then QA, I think there's something isn't right. So I think it's about limiting those items and making sure that you have the right focus across the board, right dev, QA and everything. Um, I think that 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 balance is key, and then um, and they, I think that that ensures that we we can move across uh, to the right end, deliver the product effectively. Yeah. Yeah, I think completely resonate with what Kirish and Ronak said. Uh, I think it, uh, specifically for browser stack, I can share probably numbers if it helps. I don't know if it helps or not, but because it's very subject to activation, I think we have found the sweet spot for our automation curve is eighty five. And beyond this, the last mile is too expensive and not worth it because it's just not, that's not get tested every time. But my thumb off rule for my, uh, since I think, like I said, like, you know, the, as quality of people have improved across the board, I think they are able to figure out they're testing the same things again and again, that needs to be automated. While it's something they are testing once a month or once a quarter, maybe the cost of automation is more expensive than uh, uh, doing the testing every time. So I think that's a, probably each of us needs to find. And the right answer is like Ronak said, looking at the metrics on where this time is getting spent and uh, what do we need to optimize for and solve for that problem. Whether it's more automation at that point, more engineer, this is the same thing gets answered on what's the ratio is. The platform team tends to be a little more less QA heavy because the automation testing works really well and the UI changes are less. While the more front, like the pro teams are, are required a little more 
the ratio changes and in the growth teams which probably move really fast in a lot of experiment the ratio changes altogether so i think it just depends on the not just the product but also the team structure within the organization and obviously then uh, so those aspects are very very nuances of it thank you now another question that i think is a very interesting one is um what do you see the role of qa in its relationship to user to a user experience versus just functional results um is there a place for qa feedback to um to influence uh, like the ux design for your products or applications i believe yes uh, i think we should probably uh, at least i expect from my qa team to give that feedback i recently had two conversations just when you brought it up where we had like unsubscribe link in our newsletters i think that wasn't blue and it was same as like you know click here versus the rest of the sentence was still black and i really expect uh, now you could call it as functional versus i think user experience is that poor user experience and i expect my team to call it out and probably give a strong push back to our team or to uh, uh, ux team as well uh, i think it's probably a i felt that they didn't realize it that they should do this as well while they felt like it's a lot more functional uh, but i am trying to push it little more uh, and i just picked pick this project few weeks back like it's the customer experience is your job your job is not functional testing uh, i think that's probably a little bit of a change i'm going through right now yeah i started doing a meeting called three amigo meetings where we dev qa and product sits together before even they start working on that feature and that meeting we really talked about like the before the feature is built so you're not really testing and doing functional testing you're just going through the requirement you're just talking about what the user will feel and then qa brings in all those expertise or all those ideas like how how a user will use it and i really encourage my team to start tagging those issues which we which we log as ux and not a bug and then that comes back to and we have a report which we run through which talks about and really encourage team to go do that i think that's actually added value for expert ai testing for the manual testing which we do because there's no other way you can test it there is no automation tool available to that check it that really comes from experience your sme you are expert on that product and you can add value to it so i think that's very key factor that's a differentiator honestly according to me between a good qa and a, not on an average qa who brings those issues i i think ux ui is is, is key i think that's, that's that's the main element where you do your actual manual testing right any of the other element which is unit integration api level test i think those are all technical tests that can be automated in my opinion so ideally yes the manual effort should be focused on your exploratory and ux and ui based customer experience testing i think that's that's, that's the key to your product Well, uh, one last question, you guys, since we're coming up on the top of the hour, um, and this is sort of a large one. Um, what does the future or developer? Um, I'm sorry. What does the future QA or developer look like in your mind? Or what is the future? Well, I think I, if I can start right, I mean, I have heard this term a lot: T-shaped resources, right, or engineers. I think. that's the goal i think if if an organization can achieve that uh where your engineer can write the code and test the code and ship it uh i think that's an ideal world but again i think as as we have all been discussing and have spent so much time in queue industry you need to have that acumen of of the product that you is under test right you need to you need to break the system and you can't really mark your own homework so i don't know how we can achieve that but i think that that would be an ideal state for me that's and and on top of that what i would say what i already mentioned before would i just say for me is this engineer coming out of out of school who wants to be a qa engineer that education if they have it that would be ideal state according to me that they they know that this is a a career choice which they can make and they're passionate about and they can grow in that career which is a dom very domain specific but it will and if we have an education around it and then have right people doing it that will help this industry a lot Yeah, I think just my two cents on what uh, adding on what Gary said. But I think it's probably evolution wise. It probably need to get to a point where, at least I feel we need to probably to some extent. At least uh, I probably been guilty of this. Stop treating QA as uh, I think second class citizens. I think they are probably as important as developers in the organization. 
I think that probably started happening whether you call it shift left, shift right, or agile or to various ways of moving from pivot to asset. But I think that uh, uh, that is happening, and sooner or later people will realize that uh, they are the enablers of the quality and not the. Uh, uh, I think that shift. I see a lot more organizations. The realization is there. I think some of us are still going through it, but uh, uh, some have already reached there. Uh, I think that's the most important. Uh, and whether we do it through engineers doing it or QA doing it or when QA doing it, I think that's uh, that each one will find their own answer. There's not going to be one fit, uh, one solution fits all. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. We're at time, so we'll wrap it up there. But thank you so much, uh, Nicole Girish and Ronak, for your time today. Really appreciate hearing your insights into. Um, testing and how it can affect a developer relationship and, and drive uh, developer experience and velocity. So uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time and looking forward to seeing you in our next uh, fireside chat and our upcoming webinars. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Charlie, you. for being wonderful host. And thanks, guys, for listening to our boring stories. Thanks, guys.